Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a beer, it's time for some Path of Exile discussion. So the time I'm recording this, it is 10 hours until Zizarin's Gauntlet event starts. Zizarin's Gauntlet is the biggest race event that happens in Path of Exile each league now. Uh, it's a lot of fun, even if you're not competitive, uh, it's a lot of fun to play along in. And that's exactly what I'm intending to do. I'm intending to get as far as I can in the Gauntlet, uh, and just play along for a bit of fun without any expectation that I've got the skills necessary to win any of the prizes. Though there are a bunch of prizes as well. Uh, so the Gauntlet is Path of Exile on hard mode with most, not quite all, but most of the private league mods that make the game harder. So let's have a quick look at what mobs scale most, then we'll talk about some tips and tricks, and in particular, the things you need to watch out for the most. So firstly, we have damage mods, and because of the way the damage mods work, big physical hits get more scaling. So many slams that you can tank in the normal game, even in hardcore, uh, such as like normal Azaro when you're running him at level, many of these start to become one shots again. And so that means that you need to play a lot of bosses really carefully. Something like Act 5 Katava, uh, he has a couple of attacks like his uh, one of his main slams that's really sort of hard to describe, but it's just basically a slap on the ground. Uh, that is something that if you're hit by it in the normal game, you usually survive. You try to dodge it always. But in the Gauntlet event, those sorts of ones, especially the physical ones, will become one-shots. So multiple projectiles are brutal. So there's a mod in play where monsters fire two additional projectiles with all of their skills. Uh, and this is doubly so with projectiles that leave a lingering effect on the ground. Uh, so we'll come to this when we're talking about Act 4 Piety, who's one of the most terrifying bosses in the game, in the Gauntlet event. Uh, but basically... Any sort of projectile that leaves bad things on the ground is much worse in Gauntlet because it will take up three times as much. It'll create three times as much rubbish on the ground to dodge. Uh, additionally, mon uh, Monster Onslaught. So all of the monsters have 20% increased attack and move and cast speed. Uh, so I just term that Onslaught because it's functionally equivalent. Uh, this is really dangerous in conjunction with repeated projectiles. So here I'm thinking of Chevron as one example, and then there's multiple versions of Chevron, but most of them have uh, multiple projectiles that are fired out one after another, so she just fires a barrage of them. But there's also other ones like Tentacled Miscreations, uh, which have a not very family-friendly name that I won't mention here that is usually applied to them, but they're found in Act 3 Lunaris Temple. So let's talk about uh, the terrors of Act 1. The Mudflats, Brutus, and also to a lesser extent the Coast. So firstly, the coast is pretty scary. Uh, my suggestion is that you don't try and level up in the coast. Uh, that you just zip through the coast and level and acquire loot in Hailrake Zone. Hailrake Zone is something that we visit so little in the game that I always forget what it's called. It might be Tidal Island. Uh, even though it's there in Act 6, you don't come back for it. And even though you do it in Act 1, you're in and out of there so quickly that, uh, yeah, I always forget the zone's name. But that's where you want to start leveling up in the gauntlet. Uh, just because it's somewhere that's a little bit safer and you've got mudflats straight after you and the mudflats is terrifying. So the mudflats is the hardest non-boss zone in the first 10 acts. Uh, this is a real change from previous leagues. Uh, and so the reason that this has changed is that the rowers were buffed in 3.15. So 3.15 rowers are going to move faster, uh, so they're much harder to dodge. One thing you need to know in the mudflats, if you see the unique uh, rower in the zone, you should log out. You should log out uh, and then you should come back to the zone and on your next trip to the zone, just take a different path that doesn't get near that rower. That rower is not something you want to fight, especially given how little gear you'll have uh, and given that you'll have negative 20 chaos resistance and negative 20 to most of the elemental resistances as well. And when he hits you, he's going to do elemental damage as well as physical. Then you'll start taking his chaos dot. No, nah, just get out of there. Uh, if you see, I think his name is Uzback Bloom. I just get away from him. So if you're playing any character that is not a witch or a shadow, your reward, however, for getting through the mudflats for the first time is access to the skill, uh, skill gem Decoy Totem. Decoy Totem is going to be your friend through all of the acts, and you want to grab extra copies of it. The reason you want extra copies of it is just in case you do die, uh, you want to already have it. You don't want to be in a situation where you've got to do the mudflats without Decoy Totem again. Uh, so just make sure you've got Decoy Totem, and then that'll make your future trips through the Mudflats much easier. If you're intending to play a Witch or a Shadow, uh, then what you need to do is run a different character, uh, get them through the Mudflats, and then get yourself the Decoy Totem first, then go back and play on your Witch or Shadow. So 
When you get to Brutus, uh, you should play him like he always one-shots you. So this means you're going to be making heavy, heavy, heavy use of Decoy Totem, uh, and you want to carefully ration your instant move skills so that one of them is always on cooldown if uh, Brutus starts doing one of his bigger wind-up attacks. And especially in case you get pulled by his chain hook, uh, you want to be able to instantly get away and also change the direction that Brutus needs to face in order to hit you uh, so that you can survive that. So the other thing that uh, needs to be said is that Mavale about, uh, well, about Act 1 is that Mavale is not a free fight. Uh, Mavale will put up a fight, but she's not nearly as tough as the earlier ones. A cold resist is pretty important for Mavale uh, unless you're very confident with the fight. And do remember that she has multiple projectiles. This makes her Icicle Barrage much harder to dodge than normal. Uh, so cold resistance is pretty close to essential. But you might also want to consider fire resistance for the exploding squids in phase two because they do a fair bit of damage and it's easy to get yourself into a situation where you're pretty much immune to a cold damage but you're taking massive damage from those squids uh, and that can put you in a nasty spot. Remember again, Decoy Totem is your friend for all of the act bosses, uh, but Mavale in particular, uh, Mavale just can't kill a Decoy Totem very fast uh, because she doesn't have very high DPS. That means that you can have her turned away from you firing her projectile barrage, her icicle barrage at your decoy totem. While she's doing that, you've got a free volley, a free window to get in and do damage to her. Uh, one thing to note about the second phase of Mavale as well is that multiple projectiles means that there'll be more garbage littering the ground, uh, but that is still always manageable. So act two, here we're only gonna talk about one thing and that is the Weaver. This is the nasty surprise of act two. Uh, people who have run Gauntlet before know the Weaver is deadly, People who haven't run it generally die to him on their first attempt uh, and think, why on earth did I die? I had 500 hit points and nearly maxed resistances. So don't underestimate him just because he's a free boss in the normal game. I mean, when I say free, he's, uh, he's trivial if you're a veteran player. Uh, he's certainly not trivial if you're a brand new player to the game, but I'm expecting brand new players probably aren't playing in the gauntlet. So the Weaver is one of the few bosses that does physical damage projectiles. Uh, that's in the form of its skill, which is very similar to the player skill Ethereal Knives. Uh, and this is only used when it cannot melee. So this makes the Weaver deadly at long range. It's actually safer to be close to them, uh, to the Weaver. So even if your character is something that would, would generally prefer to be at long range from enemies, uh, you probably actually want to be at point blank range with the Weaver. Uh, the Weaver scales with all of the event mods. So his Ethereal Knives are fired faster because of the Onslaught, uh, multiple projectiles because of multiple projectiles, and all of the elemental scaling. I suggest that you drop Decoy Totem close to the boss, then stand close on the other side of the, uh, of the boss from your Decoy Totem, uh, and keep recasting your Decoy Totem each time it dies. I also suggest uh, getting 700 hit points and capping your resist before Weaver. This is not trivial because the resist rolls you got access to at this point are pretty low, uh, and this will require some farming, uh, but this will allow you to make one mistake on the Ethereal Knives and survive it. Farming in this context means doing rog encounters in the Southern Forest, mostly. Uh, not necessarily Southern Forest, you can try other zones if you want. Uh, Southern Forest is my general preference though. So Southern Forest is the zone immediately after Mavale and before the Act 2 town. Uh, you'll notice I'm skipping Act 3. That's because I feel Act 3 is considerably easier than Act 2. That doesn't mean it's free, uh, it just means that there's no individual massive difficulty spikes there. Piety is probably the roughest thing in Act 3. Uh, so Act 4 has a reasonably easy start, then it gets vicious. Uh, and all of the viciousness is actually not Malachi, it's the bosses leading up to Malachi. So first note, Labyrinth isn't all that hard, uh, and it's worth doing relatively early for the power boost. It's your choice whether you do it before Dominus or pretty much immediately afterwards. You do, however, want to respect the physical damage archers in the Aqueduct and the Dried Lake, uh, especially Nightwane, who is the unique archer in the Dried Lake. Uh, you might want to log out if you encounter Nightwane, uh, because Nightwane can do a lot of damage and inflict some pretty savage bleeds, but also at the same time inflict shock because she's also doing lightning damage to you. So you wind up where you're shocked and bleeding at the same time. Uh, that's a pretty scary situation, and you want to get uh, you want to log out if that happens to you. But it's Act 4 Piety that is the hardest threat in this zone. Uh, and she is much more dangerous than usual, but not for the beam. So the beam will probably one-shot you, but I'm expecting that anyone that's capable of getting to Act 4 Piety uh, in the Gauntlet event has a lot of experience with that beam. 
Uh, it is 20% faster than usual, so it's a little bit harder, but it's not brutal. Uh, what's difficult though, is that her persistent projectiles fill the arena with garbage. So her projectiles, when she summons that sort of uh, blackish red uh, cloud of garbage that she fires out at you a few times, these will actually start to pollute the area around the arena. Uh, because she's firing them 20% faster because of her onslaught, uh, she'll have more time to fire them, but because of multiple projectiles, she'll fire three at a time. This means that these can take up a lot of the room, and you can't stand in these. You can walk through them safely, but you can't stand in them for any period of time because of the, the damage over time that they inflict is pretty considerable. So for that reason, uh, you can wind up in a situation where piety starts pushing you, uh, pushing uh, like crowding up all of the space that's safe. And then this puts you in a position where she hits you with her real killer. Her real killer is actually her close range auto attack. Her auto attack that you probably don't notice in a normal playthrough of the game because it just does physical damage. And whilst it's a lot of damage, it's very survivable. You never feel like you're in danger. Uh, Piety's auto attack in melee is a potential one shot and a certain two shot. Uh, that's because it's pure physical damage, which scales a lot with the event mods. So for this reason, uh, Piety is someone you need to really, really, really respect. Uh, you probably want to have a town portal up in there so that you can just duck into it if you get yourself in trouble. And then you can make an assessment. Do I want to return to the fight uh, through the town portal, wait and sit on the grace period until it's safe? Or do I want to just restart it? If you've got garbage in the wrong spots of the screen, maybe you decide that the safest bet is just to restart the fight. That's up to you, uh, but don't be afraid to restart the fight if you need to. Secondly, we have Doedre's Projectile Vomit. So this is where she fires a whole bunch of red balls at you. Uh, this is pretty easy to dodge, but is a one-shot if it hits, or at least can be a one-shot if it hits you. Uh, I think Decoy Totem is mandatory on this fight, uh, and you just want to basically have Doedre facing one way attacking a Decoy Totem while you kill her from behind. Uh, this is a strategy you'll use a lot, but Doedre is one of the most unforgiving bosses in the game, so you definitely want to do it there. Uh, also, don't underestimate Chevron. Uh, multiple projectiles and onslaught on her is essentially a 260% more multiplier to the number of projectiles she is creating. This makes it very difficult to dodge some of the uh, some of the shots she's firing. Uh, and as a result, again, it comes down to soaking damage with things like decoy totem. Uh, they just get in the way, take the hits so that you don't have to, uh, is something that's really good. Uh, if you are forced to make a decision between uh, between being hit by a lightning uh, lightning storm call and being in the direct in the direct path of her projectile barrage, uh, you want to get hit by the storm call. The storm call hurts, but it's not going to one shot you the way that the projectile barrage. Well, the, the projectile barrage won't one-shot you, but the first hit might stun you, uh, and if it stuns you, you're dead. Uh, after that, you have Malakai, who is much easier, and also Malagaro. Like, I, I've heard a few streamers talk about Malagaro being particularly threatening in Act 4 in the Harvest. I don't think so. Uh, of course, watch me say that and then probably die when I'm streaming tomorrow during the Gauntlet. But um, I don't think he's that bad. I think he's the easiest of the Harvest bosses. Uh, then you have Malachi, who is much easier than the than uh, Chevron and Doedre are. Uh, again, Decoy Totem has another use here, and that is a new one, and that is to detonate Rune Flare traps. So one of the things Malachi does is he marks out areas on the ground, which if you stand on them, explode. Uh, these build up and they constrain your movement through the arena. Uh, in normal play, you generally don't care that much because they're just not all that dangerous. Uh, you know, you don't want to get hit by three of them in a row but you also won't die if you get hit by two. In the Gauntlet event, you want to be a bit more concerned about these. And what you can do is just cast Decoy Totem on them, and that will cause the Rune Flare Trap to explode. Uh, so that can be a useful way that you can deal with those uh, with those things. Uh, so after this, we've got Acts 5 to 9. Now, this is the calm before the storm. The storm is the Act 9 boss, the Depraved Trinity. Uh, so from Malachi, it's smoother sailing until the back end of Act, of Act 9. There are a couple of key scary moments though, and I'll mention these first. Uh, Abyss Encounters. You might want to skip these. Uh, they just disgorge so many monsters, and so many of those monsters have a uh, scale in scary ways with multiple projectiles. Uh, and additionally, with the enemies dealing 30% of physical damage added as extra lightning damage, uh, a lot of the time they can inflict some shocks that are just mean enough to matter, uh, and this can put you in a very dangerous situation. Additionally, you'll often get chilled by these Abyss Monsters as well. 
Generally, everything Abyss related deals physical damage, and so they tend to be really scary in the gauntlet. Uh, Act 5 Katava is pretty scary. Uh, not so much because of Katava himself. Uh, well, at least not the things you're normally scared about from Katava. Not the usual things that kill you. Katava has a couple of little use skills that are projectiles uh, that in the normal game you probably don't notice because they just hit you and they do like 800 damage and you just sort of laugh it off. Uh, maybe not even 800, maybe 600. Uh, in this, they can shotgun because you can get hit by multiple shots from the same uh, from the same barrage of these projectiles. Uh, and so that's something really dangerous on Act 5 Katava. Uh, Act 7 Malagaro can be a little bit sketchy sometimes. Uh, I've heard a lot of a lot of streamers are more concerned about him than I am. Uh, Act 8 Doedre is another one that a lot of people are concerned about. Uh, that just requires a lot of really tight play and just dodging all of the... Uh, dodging all of the effluence and touching the, the valve when you need to. Uh, but the, the other thing you really want to fear is Vile side areas in this range. Vile side areas should not be underestimated at all. Uh, if you go into one, make sure you know what the boss is going to be and make an informed decision uh, before committing to the boss, before even getting the boss on screen. Uh, you do not want to get Tail Singer on the, on the screen with you in this, in this game mode. Uh, the second labyrinth is mostly free unless the trap gauntlets are particularly awful for the day. Uh, remember Stone Golem and Vitality to help you with the traps, an anti-bleed flask to help with the traps, and remember a guard skill. And of course, you'll need to play bosses carefully. Uh, whilst I think that, say, Solaris, Lunaris, uh, Brine King, some of these are among the easier bosses within the gauntlet for act bosses, uh, they're also still very, very capable of sending you on a one-way trip to standard if you make mistakes on them. Okay, so here we have Depraved Trinity. This is the run killer. This is the Act 9 boss. So all of Acts 5 to 9 has been lulling you into a false sense of security. And now you get to the Act 9 boss, and the Act 9 boss in a standard playthrough of the game is pretty easy. Uh, you know, certainly not something to be... Certainly not something to fear. Uh, Doedre on her own needs to be spoken about first. So this is when you fight the three members of the Depraved Trinity before they merge. Uh, you must have a town portal up in case you dirt the pillars here. If she starts to do her scream, what you want to do is first flame dash towards the portal, then activate your guard skill, then an instant health pot, then port out. Uh, Re-enter and abuse grace period to wait out the rest of the scream, then re-engage the fight. And make sure that you get another town portal up as well. Uh, so Depraved Trinity combines Doedre's projectile vomit balls of death, uh, the ones from Act 4, uh, but they also have a bunch of chaos damage on the ground. There's just a lot of complex things happening during that fight. Things that usually in a normal playthrough of the game you don't care about that much because none of them individually kill you and normally you can kill the boss or at least phase, phase the boss before you're in any serious danger. That's not the case in, uh, in the context of Gauntlet at all. So what you're going to need to do is manage the projectile vomit. Uh, ideally, you will never have Depraved Trinity be active without a, uh, without a decoy totem placed down to soak up those shots. You want to be on the other side of the boss from your decoy totem, uh, and ultimately you really want to out-level this fight. You want your time to, time to complete each phase of the fight to be under 5 seconds each time. Additionally, do not underestimate the scorpion intermissions. One hit won't kill you from the scorpions, uh, but three might, and they can surround you quickly. Remember that they have 20% increased move speed as well, and these are pretty fast moving monsters as it is. Additionally, you might want to time your decoy totem uh, so that you're, so that it's uh, off cooldown at the start of the next fight, which means that you might not want to use decoy totem in the uh, in the intermission sections. Okay, so a quick aside: heist is a good chance to level and gear whenever you want to out level content before you do it. So when you toss a coin to the harbor, uh, you'll be able to go to one of the event, one of the NPCs there, uh, Fitzpat the Fence, I think his name is, uh, who sells a suite of contracts that each cost a chance orb. Uh, you can loot and scoot these. So what that means is that you go into the contract, uh, you move your way, you move forward until you get to the various uh, various reward room chests. You open as many of the reward room chests as you've got alert for, and then after that you just exit the heist without trying to go for the main objective. You need to be a pretty powerful character in order to complete the heist objectives, uh, and so that might be something you don't want to do until you outlevel a contract by a lot. So what you want to do is actually bank a bunch of your contracts. So you want to go to the harbour somewhat often, maybe once an act, uh, buy out all of the contracts that you can afford, and then just stick them in your stash for a while. 
then come back six, eight levels later. Or if you're intending to actually do the objective, uh, maybe come back 10 levels later. This will be your best, uh, your best way to spend chance orbs that you loot while you're leveling. Uh, and it will also have you absolutely swimming in uniques. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that you will be rogue marker limited if you never complete heists. Uh, and so for that reason, you may wish to complete some of them that are eight to 10 levels below you in order just to uh, keep your coins coming in. Uh, but as long as you do that, you will have a lot of uniques that you'll get from heist in particular. Uh, you'll also get a lot of rares. You just it, It's generally one of the areas of the game that drops the most loot. So next we have a boss that is a complete trap, Valenta. Uh, come back to the skill point much later. And when I say much later, I mean when, your when you feel like your character is powerful enough that in the normal game mode, you could do the Eternal Labyrinth. Uh, she has one attack that will kill you because of multiple projectiles. Uh, and this is not something that you would normally expect. So she has a skill that's not too different mechanically from the player skill, uh, from the player skill um, Spectral Throw, except it is much, much slower and it looks like a black and red blob where she sort of throws something out and then it creeps back towards her. Uh, when you are doing Valenta in the Gauntlet, she will fire out three of these instead of one. Additionally, contact with any one of these is probably game over uh, because they hit brutally hard. So you want your time to phase on Valenta to be under two seconds here to minimize the danger of mistakes. So come back for the skill point when your character is massively, massively more powerful than the encounter would normally require. Uh, next tip is Katava and the Third Labyrinth. So if you're concerned about the Third Labyrinth, uh, you can Dark Shrine Fish. Uh, this means start over until you get a Dark Shrine that helps a lot in the final fight. At a bare minimum, you want to turn off the traps in the final fight. Uh, and at a, at a sort of better end, you get something like the Dark Shrine that makes all of your skills crit every time. Uh, the absolutely ultimate shrine that you can get is Divine Shrine, uh, which renders you immune to damage for the entire labyrinth, but that is very, very rare. Uh, if you're on pace at Gauntlet Start, the fight will have Charge Disruptors on Merciless Labyrinth. Uh, so the Labyrinth reset is at League Start plus 12 hours. So make sure that you're aware how the, uh, how the uh, Charge Disruptors work, uh, because you will probably want to turn them off in that fight. That'll give you a bit of breathing room so that if you do derp and get hit by Azaro in uh, the second or third fight, that you'll have a chance of surviving it. I uh, checked the layout, of course, at the PoE Lab site, so that is poelab.com. And for Katava, you need to clean up the Shamans of the Feast and the Katava's Heralds quickly. This is essential to not get over overwhelmed. And remember that Heralds are much scarier than usual. And they, like the Weaver, have physical projectiles and so they scale heaps. Anyway, that's a bunch of tips for the uh, gauntlet. Uh, if you've got any comments or questions, definitely fire away below. Uh, if you want to download the notes that I've used here, then I will put a link to them on my blog down in the description below as well. Otherwise, may your Valorbs have interesting results and have fun in the gauntlet.